Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We're back with another weekly top 10 back issues for you to be on the lookout for this video. You guys demanded it. You guys have been watching it, and we can't thank you enough. This is probably the most popular video on our channel right now, so we are definitely keeping this week in and week out. There's a bunch of stuff on this list that you can get now for cheap. A lot of hot 10, top 10 lists already peaked. They're going to come back down. But this still gives you the opportunity to get the book while it's still obtainable and has not reached that peak like we just talked about. Yeah, and again, the beauty of this list is it's a living list. So just because a book was on a list last week doesn't mean that it's irrelevant. This week, these are just 10 books to keep an eye out for. You should be adding these to your existing list and checking for these books on a regular basis. All right, we're going to get into it right now, starting with number 10. Kicking off the list this week, this is a book that was hot a few years ago, but we still have, we still think it's a good one to pick up when we're talking about New 52, Catwoman number 23. This gives us that first appearance of Joker's daughter. Yeah, now see, a lot of people, Brian, will talk about this book and they will say this is dead speculation. This book had its day, it came and went, and they're really right in all actuality with this book. But here is the reason for the validity in picking up this book right now. We know we're about to enter a storyline. When all this opens back up, comics start hitting LCSs again, written by Jeff Johns, coming from DC Comics, called The Three Jokers. And we know one of the three Jokers is the Joker that was prevalent in New 52. And that Joker had a daughter. So it is kind of, you know, kind of connect the dot situation where you could see Joker's daughter return, especially that version from the New 52. A lot of people have looked at that Batman Family 5 or 6 um, as the book to be on the lookout for. But that's Joella Dent. That's a different incarnation of the character. The one that I'm really keeping an eye out for is the one that appears in Catwoman 23 from the New 52. There is a first and a second print. Those books were dollar bin fodder. Then shot up to $15 to $20, and now they've dropped back down again. It's really one that you kind of you can't go wrong at the current pricing. Yeah, currently you can find it raw for about 5 to $9. But <laughs> here's something that... <laughs> what if joker's daughter is really punchline <laughs> no don't start that rumor <laughs> <laughs> then the next one on the list this week we are talking about iron man number 281 when i saw the list i thought jack had this on the list for completely different reasons but he has a great reason on the list i thought it was because the first appearance of masters of <laughs> i thought it was because the first appearance of the masters of silence especially with marvel and how they're going the whole Asian angle. But either way, Jack has another great point about this book. Well, I think the Masters of Silence play is a solid secondary play with this book. But to me, the reason to be on the lookout for this book is the fact that this falls into that category of these books that we're noticing, Brian, on the market where previously they had been kind of ignored cameos and now they are starting to get second life as possibly first appearances in some people's eyes. This is one of those books where you get that last page splash page big reveal of War Machine before the commonly perceived first appearance of 282 that features War Machine on the cover. Uh, 282 has long been a key book. It's long been a wall book. It's long been a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 dollar book. And quite often 281 is forgotten totally. It's in uh, back issue bins. It's in dollar boxes. Um, and as these kind of cameos have started to ascend and we've started to see 299 get solid sales, we know what Hulk 180 is doing. We're starting to see uh, 360, ASM, 360 Spider -Man. starting to sell. So we're starting to see these issues starting to sell. So at, we said that there's certain themes on this list. And this is one of those themes is it's that the ROI on these cameos um, is, is exceptional. And this is a character where we haven't seen that play out yet um, because while he's been a member of the MCU for a number of years, he's yet to really be featured. And there has been talk about a War Machine Disney Plus show or something of that nature. So I look at this and go, man, this is one of those ones for, for the amount of money that's going to cost you to get in on this. You can, you can really get in on this cheap. And, you know, if War Machine gets some more prevalence in the MCU, um, you most certainly can cash in. And then this is a book that just the community needs to be educated on. It's my COVID hair. Yes, so you're swishing your hair, <laughs> Zach Morris. All right, get your spirit fingers ready because coming in at number eight, we got Uncanny X-Men number 130. And we're talking about that first appearance of Dazzler. 
I'm not even ashamed to admit, Brian, that I kind of geeked out in the last X-Men movie when Dazzler showed up. Um, and I actually think it was kind of a cool, albeit cameo, um, depiction of Dazzler. Dazzler is a character who has such a unique comic origin, one that I think really the, the new school collector masses have not heard. This is a character created by the record industry. It was created similar to the way kind of cartoons are done, where you have a toy line, so you come out with a cartoon, and you come out with a comic, and that helps sell the toy line. This was, well, we're going to come up with a gimmick musician, and we'll put out an album. So we'll come out with a Marvel character and a comic book that will then support that. And uh, that seems so ridiculous by today's standards, but it's really what they did. And I think in turn, we get a pretty cool X-Men character with a unique history and one that can easily be adapted in today's uh, like MCU. And I really have been saying this for years. If we could get one of today's pop stars to play Dazzler, I just think that synergy is so perfect. Somebody like a Taylor Swift would play that role. And I think that's been rumored to play that role and would play that role extremely well. Um, I like Dazzler number one, but it's massively printed. I think Uncanny X-Men 130 is probably the, the better play. Yeah, and the raw copies right now sit around 75, and then I think a 9.6 just recently sold for 220. I agree. I like the character, and I kind of poke fun at it. And I think you're just straight lying. They never, ever made a cartoon to sell toys. And the masters of the universe. G.I. Joe, the American hero. <laughs> hitting our list at number seven this week this is a book that's been talked about for years as well and we're talking about omega man number three with that first appearance of lobo a lot of rumor news over the years of who might be cast to play lobo but either way this is a book that you talk about that goes up and down but it's still a great buy yeah this is a book brian i've probably bought and sold stacks of these a dozen times in the last several years just like you're saying um it's frequently cheap it's a character who is so cult popular that if you can find this book cheap, you've got to buy it. Um, I'll tend to stack up three or four of these. And then all of a sudden there'll be some sort of rumored news of a Lobo movie or something like that. And the next thing you know, this book spikes and I'm selling them. Um, the great thing is nothing's ever come to fruition and these books have dropped back down. But the reality is you start to see a pattern and there starts to be some validity to the fact that like there is a real fan base for this character uh, you know comic fans have been often clamoring for for lobo to be done correctly uh for lobo as a character who can be savage yet funny at the same time i think it gives a really unique um flavor it's it's almost think stone cold steve austin back in the attitude era of wrestling where he's like a bad guy but he's a good guy he's a he's cool. <laughs> you know it, it just um I really think uh, uh, Lobo could do extremely well in the DC universe. Uh, it's just a matter of where to fit him in. And if you've ever watched Krypton, which wasn't the greatest show, I thought that the uh, it, interpretation they did of Lobo was actually very good. Uh, I thought the actor really, really sold the character well. Now, it's on a much smaller scale, but it certainly wasn't like Inhumans, the TV show. So th there's room there for growth, and it showed the validity of the character. So... I noticed that prices are down on this book now and have been for a little while. And it may be the time to start stacking up multiple copies. Yeah. Cause there was rumor when rock was talking to DC that he might fill that role. There's also rumor that Jason Momoa, I actually think Momoa would have played that role really good, but either way, saying, I've been saying you're on the right path, but you haven't hit the right name. Roman reigns. <laughs> Hope he's a better actor than a wrestler, <laughs> but Either way, yeah, high-grade raw copies right now are going for about $30 to $50, and then there was a 9.8 that just recently sold for $190. Then at the sixth spot, we're hitting you with the trifecta again. That Right, we're talking about this whole miniseries. We're talking about that Venom Within issues number one through three. Yeah, I started off saying just issue number one, Brian. I said, screw it. Put the whole set on there. You need to be picking up issues number two and three if you can find them because selling it as a set is only going to amplify your sales of number one. But you know what they want to know, Brian? They want to know, why are we talking Venom Within? I mean, we're not talking Lethal Protector, right? We're not talking Donnie Cates' run. So what is this seemingly random We're talking about Venom Sony. Thing? Yeah, yeah, we are. We're talking Sony. And I've said it before on this channel. I've said it before on other channels. I'm bullish on the Sony universe. I think they figured it out. I think they figured out what they need to do as far as working with Marvel. 
as well as working independently to accomplish their goals. I think Morbi is going to be great. I think Venom 2 is going to be great. I'm excited where we're going with Spider-Man. This and, Enemy Within has Morbius in there with Venom. Right, and that is the connection. That's the beauty of this. Is Too many times when people are making decisions with comic uh, speculation, they forget that the investment game is about looking ahead. They're waiting for that app alert to tell them what to go run out and buy. And so much of this game and so much of making the proper ROI is looking ahead and, th and thinking for yourself. And that's what I've done with this pick. And now what I want to do is share this with all of you. So Venom Enemy Within is a story, as Brian mentioned, it is Morbius versus Venom. It's coming uh, in the world of, of Maximum Carnage, like right I, on the heels of it. You're getting uh, Demi Goblin. You're getting Carnage. You're getting a little bit of everything. Everything that's going on within the Sony universe right now could really take place. It's, it's such a logical Venom 3 that I, I would not be shocked to see it. And if we do see it, best believe that this series will spike. Absolutely. I, I would expect it to do very similar numbers to what we saw Lethal Protector do. Especially if Morbius does well. Right. And remember, while Lethal Protector may be that first Venom series, Lethal Protector really spiked because we knew that the storyline for the first movie was largely based on Lethal Protector. And we're seeing those spikes on Maximum Carnage for the sequel, even though the movie's not called Maximum Carnage. And I think we're going to see the same here with Enemy Within for the third movie. And that is my long term prediction. Yeah, and it's so great. You can get a whole set right now on eBay. One just sold for 10 bucks for all three issues. How can you beat that? And that, that cover number one, if you've never seen that, all black cover, that is a tough cover to get in good shape. So we're now halfway through the list. So do us a favor, click that thumbs up button. It really helps us out. And if you like these videos and like comic and pop culture content and you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. Click that bell so that way you're notified whenever one of these videos drop. But with that being said, Hitting us at that number five spot, we have Shauna She-Devil number one. This has a kick-ass Jim Steranko cover, 1972, but I don't think that's the only reason why you have this on this list, do you, Jack? No, and this is one of those uh, kind of picks on the list where I think that uh, it may garner kind of a what from, from the, the audience, but we talked about this being a living list, right? So we're going to build on certain themes and principles. Now, we talked about Kazar and the Savage Land in our last video. We talked about the fact that it's inevitable the MCU has to go to Savage Land. How are you going to pass up Jurassic Park with mutants? Um, and with the X-Men coming into the MCU extremely soon, it's only a matter of time. And if you, if you believe in that, right, if you believe in Kazar and the Savage Land, you've also got to kind of go down that rabbit hole and say, well, Okay, if they go to the Savage Land, if they bring in Kazar, who else will be involved? Shauna the She-Devil is right there front and center. You're talking about Kazar's wife. You're talking about uh, the kind of female lifeblood of the Savage Land. And you know you got to have that female character right there. Um, first appearance in Shauna She-Devil number one. This book is a lot less expensive than Kazar's first appearance in X-Men 10. Um, it's much more under the radar. But like you mentioned kind of a piece of comics history because it's got that great Steranko cover. Right. And recently high grade raw copies are selling between it's kind of a larger margin anywhere between 45 and there's a couple higher sales up there around 70 bucks. Then at our number four spot this week, we get Wonder Woman number seven. This is that volume two Wonder Woman and it has that George Perez cover, but even better, we get that first appearance of Barbara Minerva and who the heck is that Jack? Well, that's the second cheetah and the only cheetah that matters because the cheetah we're going to see in the movies um, pl played by Kristen Wiig. Uh, and it's eminent. And, you know, Wonder Woman 84 is coming. It's just been delayed because of the whole current pandemic situation. And Brian, I've said this on the channel several times. I'm going to at this point live and die by the success of cheetah. I really believe that this character is going to come off well on screen. Kristen Wiig. Yeah, I think they've got the right actress for it. Um, it seemed like an out of left field pick, but if you've ever watched Christian Wiig's dramatic roles, she can bring a sense of like melancholy funniness into a into a scene that really shouldn't feel funny. Um, and I think that that's going to give her the ability to play a villain very, very well. Uh, and I'm and I'm kind of excited about that. And also, I think Cheetah is a cool character, a character that um, 
has been underutilized, underexposed in comics. And we've got so many characters who are just overexposed, right? Hundreds of variant covers, tons of, of, of key issues. Um, but this is a character that outside of her first appearance, uh, people really look for seven. They look for nine. Um, they look for uh, a wonder, I think it's Justice League 13, the one in 25 Alex Garner variant from the new 52 where she's featured on the cover, or they're looking for some of her year of the villain stuff. And really outside of that, there's not much, um, you know, to go on. So I really think all of that's going to play into her benefit. So when this character shows up on screen and if she's a success that I've been banking on for a long time, you're going to see spikes. But either way, this book is a solid investment because we've already seen it spike above its current rate. And I've, I, if that's been a common theme on this list, which is buy low. There's a lot of books on this list that have already matriculated to levels that would get you a positive ROI. So all you need to do is return to the heat from the last trailer, which you'll do as soon as kind of the country gets back going and we start to know definitively when these movies are going to hit. Yeah, and it's a great point because since there's no new news right now, some of that heat's kind of died down and raw copies have been selling for about 10 bucks. So Yeah, I can't believe that. And I agree, Kristen Wiig's great at drama because, I mean, she made Ghostbusters a really sad movie. So we are down to the bottom three, and coming in at number three, we have those Maximum Carnage tie-ins. That's right, we have more than one book, but sometimes they're better together. Yeah, this is more of a strategy play, Brian, than an individual book pick. Uh, Maximum Carnage sets, I think, are going to go the way of lethal protector sets for this second movie. Um, and because of that, you're, there's going to be a great demand on them. For a long time, Maximum Carnage has been a, a kind of overlooked miniseries. It's a tough one to put together. It features 14 issues. Very unique. It's Instead of being, say, like a miniseries, it's a complete crossover arc. Yeah, like that, Web of Spider-Man and right. Spider-Man. and. So my strategy on this, and I've been doing this for about three years now, is I look for the less popular titles in dollar bin boxes and I buy them anytime I see them. That's been a policy that I've had. Anytime I see that Maximum Carnage trade dress, I buy it. Um, this will cause an imbalance. You'll get a lot of the cheap issues, but it makes it so it's cheapest possible way to put together that set. If you can pick up, say, 10 of the 14 books for a dollar, and then you have to go out and pay market value for the other four books, the Spider-Man Unlimited number one being the kind of one that ends up costing you the most because that's the first appearance of Shriek. But even that book is down a bit right now to like 12 bucks. But, you know, you're talking about some books like Spider-Man Unlimited 2, uh, Spider-Man from the McFarlane run 37, uh, Web of Spider-Man 103, Spectacular Spider-Man 202, Spider-Man number 36. Um, you know, outside of your amazing Spider-Mans, which come in at 378 and 379 and 380, those are really the only ones that are going to cost you money outside of Spider-Man Unlimited number one. And when I say cost you money, they may cost you like three or $4. So piecing this set together individually, you can put this set together for usually around $40. Well, Brian, do you have the going value for this set right now? Yeah, so currently sets on eBay are averaging about $90. So that's great ROI right there. Yeah, and it's, and it's so early for this book too. That's kind of my point. Sets are 90 mostly because you're looking at a 14 book set. That's, that's pretty legit for a, a set that size. I think this set can only get more expensive. And I don't think it's going to be like Lethal Protector or other sets of the type where it's really easy to put together sets, 14 books, spanning different titles. Um, it, there's a lot of work that's going to go into this. This set is, is far less common, put together complete than others. I think this is one that you should be building sets of right now. Now, didn't this one also have like a video game variant? Yeah, there was. There was, there was the Maximum Carnage video game, and there was a deluxe set where this you got kind of a, a comic as well as the, uh, the video game, and it came in kind of a uh, briefcase. Yeah. And that, that video game variant for the comic is extremely expensive. Yeah. We are at our second to last spot, and at number two this week, we have that Batman number 635. Love the cover on this one. We get that first appearance of Jason Todd as Red Hood in here, right? Yeah, and we talk about a lot of cheap books on this list, Brian. This isn't one of them, yeah. but 
there is cheaper than it used to be cheaper than it used to be and that's why it's on the list because there's a lot of room for growth on this book. And on top of it being cheaper than it used to be, we still have not seen Red Hood really come to fruition. And that is a common theme with so many DC Extended Universe characters because the reality of the situation is DC has false started on their film franchises so many times. So because of that, we haven't gotten Damian Wayne yet. We haven't gotten uh, Jason Todd yet. We haven't gotten these cool kind of cult characters and we talked about this is a living list we had batman 357 previously on the list so we talked about the first appearance of jason todd uh we talked a little bit about uh you know his importance and death in the family and all of that now we're coming here with that first red hood appearance because this is really going to kick off the jason todd not quite in this issue but it's going to kick off the jason todd that we know today uh that kind of badass anti-hero um character that has really resonated with fans and i think would really play well on the big screen yeah i hope they follow their casting from the animated movie and get jensen ackles to play jason todd in the live action movie as well then maybe his other brother you know get those winchester brothers together we have like the supernatural red hood and here we are the top spot Coming in at number one this week, we get that Joker number one issue. That's right. The self-titled series Joker that people are aware of, but don't talk about that much. Yeah, really don't. And honestly, every time it is talked about, Brian, I hear negativity. You hear negativity from that older comic community, that older comic crowd. When this book came out in, I think, 1975, it really was not successful. It, the um, writing isn't loved. Um, the, the art style, it's it's good but not necessarily we're not talking neil adams here right um but here's the thing here's the secret and shh don't tell anybody when we're talking vintage comics people don't read them they collect them so that doesn't really that doesn't really affect me that doesn't really slow me down um the reality of the situation is i think this book has a lot of validity in it uh, i was gonna say the value on this book even though it's everything you just said the value on this book within the past few years has grown exponentially because at one time on this channel, we talked about finding these in those $5 bins. You're not finding them in $5 bins right now. No, no, you would regularly find them in $5 bins. You'd find them. It is still a book you can find in kind of that mid grade level from time to time, 10, 15 bucks. Um, but yeah, if you're looking high grade, you do have to pay a little bit more, but it still kind of just feels unbalanced. We're talking about a seventies book. We're talking about the first Joker solo book, when you start talking about how iconic the Joker is, you got to start looking at this kind of from a step back perspective. When you start talking about Jack Nicholson's performance as Joker, when you start talking about Heath Ledger's performance as Joker, when you start talking about the most recent Joaquin Phoenix performance as Joker, you're starting to realize that like the Joker resonates kind of beyond the comics community. The mainstream movie going audience has really connected with this character. This character far exceeds anything that we have going on. Um, furthermore, I just, yesterday I watched the uh, Prince music videos from the 1989 Batman movie, which I think people don't realize, like Prince put out multiple music videos with him dressed as the Joker. Um, this is a character who is- beloved. With all the Vicky Vales on the stage. Yeah, all the v dancing Vicky Vales and the female Batmans and everything. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I think that the average public, it kind of has, we've gotten to, close to it to really sit back and see and realize like the joker is almost as big as everything else in comics um the todd phillips movie was a smash success there's talk about a sequel um i think that they're not going to be able to leave a billion dollars on the table so there probably will be a sequel we've talked already in this episode about going into the three joker storyline and what that's going to do on the publishing side i really think that the Joker is pure money. It's pure money from a publishing standpoint. It's pure money from a film standpoint. I don't think the Joker is going anywhere. And I think that this book, being the fact that it's a number one, it's the first solo issue. It's the first solo story. It's uh, a Joker cover, Joker trade dress. It's not a modern book. It's it's not just everywhere. Um, I think that this is a book that could, over time, become iconic. And, and at its current value, it is sorely undervalued what its potential should be based on the character. Yeah, you're looking at right now raw about $50, which I think is a great price. Nine eights, those higher nine eights, nine sixes, you're getting into like $200, $250, which for PC, I'd, I'd spend that. Yeah, $250 for a nine eight. I mean, to me, like if, if we were talking comparable, um, 
from that era in a nine eight, you should be paying more. Yep. But there we have it. Another top 10 back issue list in the books. Again, like I said, stay tuned because we're going to do something pretty amazing with these lists after we get down the road a little bit more. We're going to do a few more of these, but then we're going to have something special for the viewers. And I think it's going to be a fantastic idea. So stay tuned for that. And again, do us a favor and click that thumbs up button. Comment down below. Let us know what you guys think of this list. Let us know if you guys have any of these issues. Either way, what do you think, Jack? Oh, you know, I love the list. Build on some principles we've already talked about. Build on some concepts and some characters that we've already talked about. Keeps it moving. And I think something to pay attention to going forward is that Joker pick at number one. I think we're going to see some more picks, Brian, that aren't first appearances, but instead are just kind of key classic books that, you know, are blue chips and people need to be grabbing now. All right. Like we said, this is one of those lists that you can put in your comic book notebook. Be on the hunt and start adding some of these to your collection because these are great books. But either way, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for clicking that thumbs up. Thank you guys for commenting. And thank you for subscribing. This is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.